You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on BostonFreeRadio.com, watching and listening on on Somerville Community Access TV or some community TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast, to whom I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. And the views and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of anyone who is employed with this broadcast or the station as a whole. So with that said, let me get to my first segment, which is what's topping the box office. These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. Number one at the box office, actually numbers one through six at the box office this week are exactly the same as last week. So really, I've never had it so that not only are the top six exactly the same as last week, but there are no debuting movies in the top ten whatsoever. The one movie that I said would be in wide release, The Disaster Artist, actually turned out not to be in wide release. There was only one theater in Boston that was showing The Disaster Artist, and... Yeah, it's it's just it's it's surprising to me that they said it was going to be a wide release, but in reality it wasn't. So if it wasn't playing exactly at a theater near me, it probably wasn't playing at a theater near you either. But in any event, people are still going to the movies, and the number one movie at the box office this past weekend was Coco. Last week it grossed quite a bit. <laughs> I don't have the exact number, but this past weekend it grossed $27.5 million. It definitely didn't gross that last week. But on a budget of between 175 and $200 million, Coco has so far grossed 27, excuse me, $110.1 million at the U.S. box office and $291.4 million worldwide. So what that, excuse me, Sorry, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty here. So, anyway, so Coco is not a hit yet here at the... Sorry. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of a technical issue with my uh, my Facebook feed. But anyway, Coco is not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is a tentative hit. But hopefully it will be certified for this movie's sake because it is a really good film. Justice League is number two at the box office this weekend, as it was last week, having made $16.7 million. Against a budget of $300 million, Justice League has so far made $197.4 million at the U.S. box office, and around the world so far, it has made $569.2 million. So, it is not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world, it is a tentative hit that is very close to being a certified hit. And my guess is it will probably be certified around the world by next week. Third highest grossing debut movie of the week is Wonder, which grossed $12.1 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of just $20 million, Wonder has so far grossed $87.7 million here in the States, and around the world it has grossed $102.3 million, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Thor Ragnarok is doing gangbusters at the box office. This weekend, it grossed a modest $9.9 million in its fifth week in release, but against a budget of $180 million, which, mind you, is $120 million less than Justice League, Thor Ragnarok has so far grossed $291.6 million at the U.S. box office and a staggering $817.8 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States. And it might eke its way to being a certified hit here in the States, but around the world, it is most definitely certified with a bullet. Daddy's Home 2 is number five at the box office this weekend, as it was last week. This week, it grossed $7.6 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $69 million, Daddy's Home 2 has so far grossed $82.9 million 
at the U.S. box office so far in its four weeks in release, and $116.8 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States and a tentative hit worldwide. It would have to make $138 million or more to become certified, but I'll let you know when that happens, if it happens. Murder on the Orient Express is number six at the box office this weekend, as it was last week, having made $6.8 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $55 million, Murder on the Orient Express has so far grossed $84.8 million here in the States, and around the world it has so far grossed $238.2 million, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is a certified hit. Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri is actually one of the only, the only movie in the top ten that went up from last week. Actually, one of two, but this was the only one that was in the top ten last week. So, last week, Three Billboards, you know the rest, was number ten at the box office. This week, it's number six, having grossed $4.4 million. Against a budget of $12 million, Three Billboards, you know the rest, has so far grossed $13.5 million at the U.S. box office. I don't have the international numbers for you for that movie, but I can tell you that here in the States, Three Billboards is a tentative hit. Lady Bird was not in the top 10 at all last week, but in its fifth week in release, it climbed from approximately number 11 or number 12 to number 8 at the box office this weekend, having grossed $4.3 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $10 million, Lady Bird has so far grossed $16.8 million here in the States and $17.2 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. The Star fell from number 7 last week to number 9 this week, having grossed $4.1 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $20 million, the star has so far grossed $27.4 million here in the States and $29.1 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the States and, and around the world. And finally, at number 10 of the box office this weekend is A Bad Mom's Christmas, which grossed $3.4 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $28 million, The Bad Mom's Christmas has so far grossed $64.4 7 million here in the States and 102.9 million around the world. My life changed because someone was there to get me to use drugs. No one can understand. People think that having someone who will listen makes it better. I need help. I'm listening. I need help. I think that having someone who will listen makes it better. People understand. No one can get me to use drugs. My life changed because someone was there to listen. Go to heretolisten.com for tips and tools to turn addiction around. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society, race is a topic that affects us all. And yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race boston free radio welcome back to words on film the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures i'm your host and movie critic dan burke and i did manage to see four new films for this week but it wasn't easy i had to hit up the indie film theaters a lot more than i usually do but the good news is that i did manage to see four movies one of which was well, dramatized. I, I don't want to say it's fictional because it actually isn't. It's based on a true story. So the first film I'm going to review for you for this show is The Disaster Artist. And The Disaster Artist is directed by James Franco and starring James Franco and his brother Dave Franco, as well as having a slew of other noteworthy cameos. So this is the true story of a 
an aspiring film actor named Greg Sestero, who meets the weird and mysterious Tommy Wiseau in an acting class. And when they meet, they form a unique friendship and travel to Hollywood to make their dreams come true. And after experiencing a number of setbacks, as most actors who move to L.A. do, Greg Sestero and Tommy Wiseau decided to make a movie together. And that was just the beginning of their trials and tribulations. So... Not very much of a spoiler alert, but the reason this movie is called The Disaster Artist is because the movie that Tommy Wiseau wrote, directed, produced, and starred in was indeed a disaster. It is still regarded as the worst film of all time, but because of that reputation, it has actually maintained a cult classic. So, I had my doubts about The Disaster Artist because I've seen The Room. Many, many times, most notably at my favorite movie theater, the Coolidge Corner Theater in Brookline, Massachusetts. They have midnight screenings of that movie, and I got to tell you, it is a lot of fun to see that movie because it's not one of those films you, you go into knowing that it has a bad reputation and then you see it and you think to yourself, well, it's not that bad. No, trust me, it is that bad. Just about every conceivable thing that you could imagine would go wrong with a movie seemed to have gone wrong with this one. I'm sure a light didn't fall on one of the cast members' heads, but that's not a compliment you give a movie in in any event. So my anticipation was pretty high for The Disaster Artist, and I had some reservations about James Franco playing Tommy Wiseau. First of all, James Franco is way too good-looking to play Tommy Wiseau. And secondly, James Franco and Dave Franco look a lot alike, so much so that I couldn't imagine both of them playing people who are not related alongside each other. But they managed to do a pretty good job. James Franco gives it his all here as Tommy Wiseau. And he certainly disappears into the role. And even though James Franco is still a lot better looking than Tommy Wiseau by quite a bit of a long shot, I, there were still moments where I almost thought I saw the real Tommy Wiseau in James Franco. It's kind of weird. But I do have to give probably the, the biggest props to Dave Franco in this movie. I think The Disaster Artist is actually Dave Franco's best role to date. Because here, he doesn't live in the shadow of James Franco. And I'll say this also about Dave Franco and his acting. It's very easy for an actor to play weird. You know, I I think especially James Franco has no problem doing that. But it's much harder to play a guy who's not a caricature. A guy who is certainly easily relatable and certainly has a dream and struggles with that dream. It's not very easy to play the latter kind of character, but I do think that Dave Franco, even though he's probably experienced these kinds of setbacks himself as an up and coming actor, I I think he can, he tapped into that part of Greg Sestero's story very well. So I can't exactly say how true The Disaster Artist is to the book upon which it's based, which I haven't read, but I actually did buy a copy and give it to my brother for Christmas, autographed by Greg Sestero, who actually is coming back into town in about a week to promote actually a midnight screening of The Room at Coolidge Corner Theater in Brookline, as I previously noted, but... I I like the disaster artist a lot. I I did think that it stayed focused. I thought that it very much de- very well detailed what what really went wrong with the room. How it was pretty much unfocused from the start, and how Tommy Wiseau is a man whose ambition far exceeded his talent. And there are a lot of people who succeed despite their ambitions far exceeding their talents, but Tommy Wiseau had a lot of tenacity, a lot of ambition, but not a lot of experience or talent or even common sense that you would imagine it would take to make such a movie. But it turns out that 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 determination with some very blind stubbornness 
ended up being great for the movie overall. I, I do have to say that the epilogue to The Disaster Artist left a, a lot to be desired. I, I did think that it it greatly emphasized how much of a cult classic The Room has become, which actually Ed Wood, uh, a movie to which this movie can be compared uh, easily didn't quite have that same effect, but of course Ed Wood left a much better epilogue, a written epilogue that is. But one of the things I really wanted to know about the uh, about the movie The Room is how much it actually grossed. This movie will tell you how much it grossed its opening weekend, but what it won't tell you is how much it's grossed to date, and it's got to be. At least $10 million, I would imagine, because people have come back to see this movie again and again and again. I was one of them. But overall, I really like The Disaster Artist. I think James Franco and Dave Franco did a great job acting in this movie. I also love the supporting turns by the likes of Seth Rogen and countless others who made cameos. And The Disaster Artist gets my rating of a knockout. It is compelling without being the disaster that the room was. It certainly emphasized how being the worst movie is almost as distinguishable as being the best movie ever made. And I think it it says a lot how there are probably more people my age who have seen The Room than have seen Citizen Kane, for instance. But I was really impressed with The Disaster Artist. It was a lot better than I thought it was going to be. And I think you're going to be hearing more about Come on, smile. Oh, honey, he's still not smiling. Maybe he's not a smiler. Yeah, maybe he's just not a happy baby. Maybe he's just being a boy. Or maybe he's teething. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe he has autism, and we can definitely do something to help. Maybe is all you need to find out more about autism. No big, joyful smiles by six months is one early sign. Learn the others at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson, and I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage, and punk, Motown, Old School R&B, Soul, Blues, Jazz, Gospel, Folk, Old School Country, Zydeco, All Music New Orleans, Rockabilly, Bluegrass, World Music, Comedy, Poetry, and Spoken Word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to review is Jim and Andy, The Great Beyond, which is a documentary about the making of the 1999 biopic Man on the Moon, which was the story of Andy Kaufman. And Andy Kaufman was portrayed in that movie by Jim Carrey. That came out 18 years ago, but what's weird is that this documentary details the the filming of Man on the Moon. It has a lot of behind-the-scenes footage, which, for some reason, according to Jim Carrey, Universal Studios refused to put out until now. I'm not sure what made Universal Studios change their mind, but then again, the movie came out in 1999. It came out on video and DVD in 2000. And back then, DVDs were on the market, but... More people had VCRs than DVD players, plus the other additions to DVDs like special features were not quite in demand back then as much as they are now. But then again, DVD sales and Blu-ray sales, for that matter, have gone down significantly. So I'm not sure how much of a regard people put on special features now as much as they did 
about 10 years ago. I know I certainly like the special features on DVDs if they're good. And I would have loved to have seen this behind the scene footage of Jim Carrey channeling Andy Kaufman. And the documentary in its full title is actually Jim and Andy, the great beyond featuring a very special contractually obligated mention of Tony Clifton. Well, despite the title there, Tony Clifton isn't mentioned. He appears here and Tony Clifton is an alter ego of Andy Kaufman. And the, 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 the gimmick behind Tony Clifton was that even though Andy Kaufman portrayed him, the two of them, both Andy Kaufman and Tony Clifton, regarded each other as separate characters. And J- Andy Kaufman was actually not the only person to portray Tony Clifton or poses Tony Clifton. Actually, his comedy partner, Bob Zmuda, sometimes posed as Tony Clifton, as well as other people did as well. So this documentary details Jim Carrey not only channeling Andy Kaufman and staying in character as Andy Kaufman, after the the cameras stopped rolling, a very method acted, a very method acting technique. But Jim Carrey also stayed in character as Tony Clifton when he put on the prosthetic chin, the mustache, and the bad hair. So it's all great to see that. But what's interesting to me is that this this documentary you can see on Netflix. It's been on Netflix since November seventeenth, but. What's really interesting to me about Jim Carrey getting in this this method acting of Andy Kaufman is, first of all, it worked really well for him. I thought he was amazing in the movie Man on the Moon, and it is actually a travesty that Jim Carrey was not nominated for an Oscar for Best Actor for Man on the Moon. Man on the Moon was not a commercial success, despite having Jim Carrey in it. And it it was Jim Carrey's first box office flop since Ace Ventura Pet Detective. But uh, it was a critical success, and it didn't really get a lot of Oscar attention, I thought, that it really deserved. But it is fascinating that Jim Carrey employed these method acting techniques because Jim Carrey is one of the very few A-list actors who succeeded in the acting world despite having never reportedly taken an acting class. And there are only a couple of people who became successful actors and have never formally trained as an actor. And a lot of them are actually pretty big ones. Tom Cruise never took an acting class. Cameron Diaz never took an acting class. Jennifer Lawrence is reported to have never taken an acting class. And Jim Carrey, of course, joins those ranks. But Jim Carrey is at a point in his career right now where if he doesn't want to do a movie for the rest of his life, he doesn't have to. And judging from the fact that there are YouTube videos of him painting and putting out some introspective philosophy, and he's also grown a full beard, we may not see him in a starring role in a comedy for a very long time. But that doesn't mean he's completely out of the spotlight. He's still making appearances in documentaries like this, as well as late-night talk shows. And there are actually some fascinating YouTube videos about Jim Carrey, which feature Jim Carrey, that you can find on YouTube right now. But seeing this documentary was not only a lot of fun, but it also showed how dedicated Jim Carrey was to portraying Andy Kaufman. He certainly has a lot of affection for the late Andy Kaufman, who died, by the way, in 1984 of a rare type of lung cancer, despite having not smoked very much in his life. But if you actually see the footage of Jim Carrey as Andy Kaufman in a given scene, and then see Andy Kaufman actually acting out that scene, or or rather being in that scene, like the time he was on Late Night with David Letterman, and he was in a very public spat against Jerry Lawler. It's it's amazing how Jim Carrey got those scenes down to a T. But this, you know, Jim Carrey also got the mannerisms of Andy Kaufman right. He got the voice of Andy Kaufman right. And this was despite the fact that Jim Carrey does not look a lot like the late Andy Kaufman. As a matter of fact, 
I think Jim Carrey is actually much better looking than Andy Kaufman. And I don't think many other people will disagree. But this is a great behind-the-scenes look on the set of Man on the Moon. I'm not sure why it w- they it dis- that Jim Carrey or whoever filmed this footage decided to put it out 18 years after Man on the Moon. It'd be one thing if it was released in 2019 for the... 20th anniversary or if it was released on the anniversary of Andy Kaufman's death but that doesn't really matter because it's a movie that is really a great tribute to Andy Kaufman and also really shows you how the Oscar snub that Jim Carrey received was certainly not particularly well deserved and Jim and Andy gets my rating of a knockout it is indeed a fascinating documentary Jim Carrey is a little intense in it but By no means is this a boring documentary, nor is it one that's not worth your time either. I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. I think it's great for any fans of comedy, any fans of Andy Kaufman, and anybody who is interested in pursuing acting as a career. They'll get a lot out of seeing this movie. And Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me, but I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org slash caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Hi, listen to me, Ed Robleski, every Wednesday from 5 to 7 for Talking Hendrix, where we will celebrate the music and legacy of Jimi Hendrix's career and much more. Tune in every Wednesday from 5 to 7 when we hear on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on Summerville Community Access TV or some community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast, and to them I say thank you very much, or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is another documentary. This one is called Jane. And using a trove of unseen footage, or previously unseen footage, the film tells the story of Jane Goodall's early explorations, focusing on her groundbreaking field work, her relationship with cameraman and husband Hugo von Lawick, and the chimpanzees that she studied. Now, I believe they made a fictionalized version of Jane Goodall's life called Gorillas in the Midst, which starred Sigourney Weaver. And that came out in the early 80s, but I actually have not seen that movie. But I am familiar with Jane Goodall's story and some of her research. The movie Jane is directed by Brett Morgan, who wrote and directed other esteemed documentaries, most notably The Kid Stays in the Picture, which is a movie about and revolving around a famed film producer Robert Evans and also the recent HBO documentary Kurt Cobain Montage of Heck which I thought was a fascinating documentary about Kurt Cobain I thought I knew everything there was to know about Kurt Cobain but Montage of Heck Heck taught me a lot more about him and those two movies especially go to show you that Brett Morgan knows his documentaries, and he also makes informative as well as entertaining documentaries, and Jane is certainly no exception to that rule. This film was also released by National Geographic Films, which is very appropriate because there is a lot of great footage here of Jane Goodall doing her research on chimpanzees as well as some very fascinating footage of the chimpanzees themselves, which were shot mostly by her husband, or rather ex-husband, Hugo von Lawick. And the movie starts from more or less the very beginning, that Jane Goodall came from a British family, not a poor one, but certainly a lower middle class one. And she didn't go to college because she couldn't afford to go to college. However, she traveled to the jungle for the first time with in Explorer as his 
as a secretary and basically never really left the jungles of Africa. And she is one of those women who finds more, or one of those people, I should say, who finds more spirit in the animals than she does actual people. Jane Goodall in this movie didn't come off as autistic, but she certainly had, well, the the fact that she understands animals better than she understands humans, or so she says, is one particular quality of some autistic people. But I, other than that, I didn't get a sense that Jane Goodall was autistic, but I just thought I'd, I'd put it out there. So there's not a lot else to say about this documentary other than the fact that it's amazing how much good unused footage they put into this film. And I also liked how Brett, Brett Morgan in particular uses that archive footage as every great documentary maker should to tell a story and to enhance the narrative. And there wasn't one frame of Jane where I wasn't completely taken by this movie. As a matter of fact, when I think about great documentaries of the year, I'm always wrong about which films I think, which documentaries I think will be nominated for Oscars. Two years ago, for instance, I thought for sure that Life Itself, the documentary about Roger Ebert directed by Stephen James, and Hodorowski's Dune would be nominated for Best Documentary Feature at the Oscars. And these were two movies, by the way, that not only were among my favorite films of 2015, but they also were ranked in Entertainment Weekly as two of the top ten best films of 2015. Despite that... These two films did not get the Oscar nominations that either I or other critics thought it deserved. But I have the feeling, based on its subject matter and also because of its worldwide appeal, that Jane will be nominated for an Oscar for Best Documentary this year. It's already been receiving raves at Sundance and Cannes and the Toronto International Film Festival, which it was just featured at, or maybe... Just Featured is a little too loose a term. It it came out at the Toronto Film Festival three months ago. I I think that was when it it, it came out. And I am a film critic who unfortunately doesn't get to go to a lot of film festivals, but... (laughs) <laughs> that may change in the next year. I'll, I'll get, <laughs> I'll, I'll write down some New Year's resolutions in, in the next coming weeks, seeing that it's December and all. But Jane is a movie that has a fascinating subject in Jane Goodall, and not only that, but Jane Goodall's ex-husband Hugo von Lawick used his services as a cameraman incredibly well, and. Not only that, but whoever worked for Mr. Von Lawick, who died in 2002, preserved his films extremely well, whether they meant to or not. I'm not I'm not even sure if Hugo Von Lawick was just building up to this documentary. And of course, a lot of Von Lawick's footage was probably used for other Nat Geo specials or specials on PBS like Nova or Nature, Um, but it's amazing (laughs) with all the footage that was cut for TV, how much other good footage was being used. But fortunately, Brett Morgan, kudos to him for finding this footage, kudos to him for putting it together in such a fascinating and well-organized documentary. And for that reason, Jane gets my rating of a knockout. I have about 25 seconds more to talk about this film, or maybe even less than that, but I really don't know what else there is to say. I've already mentioned the footage. It's great that Jane Goodall was able to be interviewed for this documentary. I don't know if any other people who were interviewed for this documentary would have benefited. It wouldn't have hurt, but Jane, as itself, great documentary, best of the year. (sighs) 
Steven. Who said that? Me, down here. Oh, what are you, a yellow booger? I'm a banana slug, Steven. What are you doing in my room? I'm your sense of adventure. It's been a long time since we've had an adventure in the forest. Mom took me to the forest last year. I'm a slug, Steven. It took me a long time to get here. You're right. I should get out. Yeah, the forest is not that far away. Hey, Mom! Come to the forest where the more adventurous you lives. Check out discovertheforest.org for cool places nearby. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. You're listening to Boston Free Radio. All things fresh, live, and local on bostonfreeradio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to review for you is Bill Nye Science Guy. Yeah, it, it's a documentary indeed about Bill Nye, uh, host of the famous kids show Bill Nye the Science Guy, which aired from 1993 to 1997. It had 100 episodes or so, and it won a staggering 18 Emmys around the time it it was on. And even though Bill Nye doesn't host that show anymore, it's been nearly 20 years since he hosted his last episode, he's actually reemerged in recent years, particularly as a proponent of science education and particularly subjects that are pertinent to today's world. And that's what the documentary Bill Nye Science Guy covers. It covers a little bit about Bill Nye's growing up and how he became the host of a very well-revered children's show or show for students uh, from probably fifth grade through 12th grade and how his influence as a host and as a scientist is felt to this very day. So in this documentary, it details his, uh, Bill Nye's struggle to restore science to its rightful place in a world hostile to evidence and reason. So this movie is not particularly an attack on the conservative media, so to speak, but it just matter-of-factly states that there are a number of people who are against the study of science and who deny climate change probably most dangerously who happen to be conservative as a matter of fact there is one person who is featured in this documentary who is actually a creationist or somebody who believes in creationism over evolution and he is an australian man by the name of ken ham who is stationed in kentucky and one of his big Things is he goes all around the country, even talking to schools about how people should accept creationism as a legitimate science and not evolution. However, as Bill Nye states, there are there's an overwhelming amount of evidence that supports Charles Darwin's theory of evolution and creationism is based primarily on opinion and not so much fact in fact there are museums that ken ham actually opened that show dinosaurs coexisting alongside humans and the implication in fact the the, these museums are saying that that is what actually happened which is complete nonsense And, and bill nye even says rightly so but not as confrontationally as i would you know he looks at the exhibit where humans are, you know, cavemen are interacting alongside dinosaurs, and he says, this is not scientifically accurate. There's an overwhelming amount of evidence that dinosaurs lived first, then died, then humans came later. The dinosaurs were in the Mesozoic era, and the humans were in the Cenozoic era. And these kinds of exhibits 
are doing a disservice to children. And I happen to believe that Bill Nye is absolutely right. I thought he was a fantastic host of Bill Nye the Science Guy, and it really speaks wonders that Bill Nye the Science Guy, the the TV show, is still being shown in classrooms to this day, even though it's got a, a, a few dated 90s references and some pop culture references in them, but the science is basically the same in these shows, in addition to the fact that Bill Nye is the science teacher that millions of American students, and maybe some Canadians too, wish they had. Um, So Bill Nye goes around the country now basically promoting science education, and all the power to him for doing that. He's already won a bunch of Emmys. I do think that eventually Bill Nye should win a Nobel Prize. And a lot of critics against Bill Nye state that Bill Nye is not actually a scientist because he doesn't hold a Ph.D. in science, which I don't think is particularly valid. He does have a degree in engineering from Cornell, and he certainly has practiced science before. And he has a great TV show on Netflix right now, which is called Bill Nye Saves the World, which I have not seen entirely. I've seen about one or two episodes, and these episodes are great. And I've said this before about Al Gore and his documentaries, both An Inconvenient Truth and the one that came out this year, An Inconvenient Sequel. I think that either one of those films and Bill Nye Science Guy should be watched back-to-back, especially by people who deny that climate change exists. The reason for this is because here are two people who know what they're talking about, who have the scientific facts behind them, and will give them to you if you listen. And I, I think that these, these two, Bill Nye and Al Gore, have solutions that unfortunately a lot of people, particularly in Washington, D.C., and I won't name names, President Trump, are not listening to. And uh, yeah, I, I let my politics get a little bit out there, but I do really have to emphasize, not as a liberal, not as a conservative, but how stupid it is for anyone, regardless of their political beliefs, to ignore science. And I think that the science in this film speaks for itself. And I'm getting really passionate about what I saw in this film. But again, if anyone who is a climate change denier has to see Bill Nye Science Guy, the documentary, and they will probably change their minds. And what I like about Bill Nye is he is very charismatic, check. He's very smart, check. But he's also not particularly... He's he's still a nice guy, and I I also like how he's not confrontational when giving his opinion, unlike most of the people who deny climate change, who are extremely confrontational. But Bill Nye Science Guy is a documentary that must be seen. I haven't decided yet whether or not it's better than an inconvenient sequel. They're certainly on par in terms of very important subject matter, and Bill Nye Science Guy gets my rating of a knockout. Like the other documentaries that I've seen, it is a it is a documentary that is well worth seeing, and this one is actually important to see. My savings are gone. Okay, where were they last? Here, right before I spent them on that vacation to Aruba. Weird. Not weird. Not saving now means no money later. For free ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. I love those real six sides. They're the ones that move. All this and more on Unpopular Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. 
Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed all the movies that I'm going to review for this show, it's now time for my next segment, which is what's coming out next. These are the high-profile movies that are coming out in theaters near you, probably. And if they're not coming out in theaters near you, I will let you know. But this is all based on information that I get from a particular source. So check your local list things because I can't guarantee whether or not these films will actually come out in the theater near you, but I can differentiate which films will come out nationwide and which ones will be more limited release, maybe at your local art house cinema, maybe. But with that said, let's get into movies that are coming out probably in wide release. I put probably in parentheses. One of the movies that is actually expanding into theaters nationwide is the newest from director Guillermo del Toro, and it is called The Shape of Water. This is an otherworldly fairy tale set against the backdrop of Cold War era America circa 1962. In the hidden high-security government laboratory where she works, lonely Eliza, who's played by Sally Hawkins, is trapped in a life of isolation. Eliza's life has changed forever when she and co-worker Zelda, who's played by Octavia Spencer, discover a secret classified experiment. And that is all the movie is telling me. I assume this is a science fiction movie, but it's categorized on IMDb as adventure, drama, fantasy, horror, romance, and thriller. Unfortunately, it is rated R, so people under the age of 17 won't be able to see it without a a parent or guardian accompanying them, but it might be worth it because, honestly, the theme of this movie doesn't sound R-rated. I would imagine that a movie like this maybe would have been better rated PG-13, but then again, I could be wrong. It could be a lot more explicit and a lot more graphic than... I'm led to believe, but I don't know because I don't watch previews anymore. So as I said, the movie stars Sally Hawkins and Octavia Spencer. It also co-stars Michael Shannon and Doug Jones. And anything that comes from Guillermo del Toro, good or bad, or is at least interesting. And I actually, I don't think I've ever seen a movie by Guillermo del Toro that was bad. I'd probably say the quote-unquote worst film he's done is Hellboy 2, but even that was really good. So, The Shape of Water is probably coming to a theater near you. Check your local listings. But if it's coming out in a theater near me, I will definitely see it, and I'll let you know what I think next week. Another movie that is probably coming out in the theater near you is one called Just Getting Started. This movie is about a two-hander, or rather, the movie is a two-hander action comedy in the vein of Midnight Run about an ex-FBI agent, played by Tommy Lee Jones, and an ex-mob lawyer in the witch... in the Witness Protection Program, played by Morgan Freeman, who are having to put aside their petty rivalry on the golf course to fend off a mob hit. The movie also co-stars the late Glenn Headley, who I think died this year, and also co-stars Renee Russo. I haven't seen her in quite some time, but it looks like a really good movie. It has two Academy Award winners in the lead roles. I think Renee Russo is an Academy Award nominee, but don't quote me on that. But Just Getting Started is a movie that looks like it has a pretty good plot. Again, I think when the tag or rather the plot synopsis says it borrows from Midnight Run, that's not the greatest sign. But then again, if you're going to borrow, borrow from one of the best and most underrated buddy comedies that has been released. So anyway, Just Getting Started is directed by Ron Shelton. It might be coming out in the theater near me. If it is coming out in the theater near yours truly, I will see it, and I'll let you know what I think when I review my show next week. And this is a movie I have reviewed for this show, but definitely seek this movie out. It is a knockout in my book. It is The Disaster Artist, and just to give you a repeat synopsis, When Greg Sestero, an aspiring film actor, meets the weird and mysterious Tommy Wiseau in an acting class, they form a unique friendship and travel to Hollywood to make their dreams come true. This is a film I think you definitely should see, especially if you've seen The Room. And if you haven't seen The Room, see The Room first. I guarantee you, you will not regret it. It is an awful movie, no doubt, but it is so much fun to watch. In fact... When I was reviewing movies for IMDb, I actually labeled The Room as, and I quote, the worst movie I ever enjoyed watching. And I stick to that. 
So the Disaster Artist might be coming out in the theater near you. It's definitely expanding nationwide, although that's what they said last week. But again, check your local listings. Now, another movie that's coming out in limited release, I think I've gone for the wide releases now, and it actually wouldn't surprise me if Coco is number one at the theaters next week. In fact, that's my prediction. Coco is going to be number one in movie theaters. But anyway, a film that's coming out in limited release is one called I, Tanya. It is the long-awaited biopic, biopic excuse me, about competitive ice skater Tanya Harding who rises amongst the ranks at the U.S. Figure Skating Championships, but her future in the activity is thrown into doubt when her ex-husband intervenes. So the movie stars Margot Robbie as Tanya Harding, and one of the qualms I have about Margot Robbie playing Tanya Harding is that Margot Robbie is way too beautiful to play Tanya Harding. Tanya Harding was not a bad-looking or not a... Not a particularly bad-looking woman, but Margot Robbie is far beyond that. She's a 10, maybe higher. But the director, Craig Gillespie, has brought us such movies which have actually been um, pretty well-revered, like Lars and the Real Girl, starring Ryan Gosling, which I thought was okay. He also directed Fright Night, which I haven't seen, and the Disney film Million Dollar Arm, which actually was out in theaters when I first started reviewing this show, but I didn't actually get a chance to see it. The other biopic he directed, which was also a Disney film like Million Dollar Arm, was The Finest Hours, which starred Chris Pine and uh, Casey Affleck, and a number of other notable actors. Uh, Ben Foster was another one, Eric Bana. And that film I actually thought was pretty underrated. It certainly was gripping. But Craig Gillespie is directing the Tanya Harding biopic. And again, it's in limited release. I don't know if this film is coming out in a theater near me. I do know it's a film I look forward to seeing. And... While I had qualms with Margot Robbie playing Tanya Harding because she's way too beautiful to pass as Tanya Harding, I do think that Margot Robbie has proven herself to be a great actress, and I can't wait to see what this film's like. Hi, this is Josh Groban. My favorite thing about music is its ability to inspire and nourish the soul. That's why I'm proud to work with Feeding America, an organization that inspires hope for families in need and helps nourish the 16 million kids in this country struggling with hunger. The Feeding America nationwide network of food banks gathers surplus food and helps get it to kids in need. But they can't do it alone. Find out how you can help at feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And continuing with my segment of what's coming up next is another series of limited releases. One of the films that's coming out in limited release, which I kind of doubt is coming out in a theater near me, maybe it's coming out in a theater near you, is a movie called Hollow in the Land. This is a movie about a woman with a troubled past who sets out to find her missing brother. And that's all the plot synopsis is giving me. It's directed by Scooter Corkle and stars Diane Agron, Rachel LaFerve, Sean Ashmore, and Jared Abramson. So, full disclosure, I don't know who any of these actors are. I actually am curious to see what Scooter Corkle has directed. Uh, Let's see. He's been actually working in the camera and electrical department for years, and this is actually his feature-length debut movie. He directed one short film in 2009 and one in 2014, so he's actually taking a step into the crowded director's field. But Hollow in the Land is a movie, I might see it, but... Again, I can't guarantee I'll see it, but if I do, as usual, I'll review it for you on the show next week. 
Another movie that's coming out with some actors I've heard of is one called November Criminals, coming out in December, ironically enough. It's about a teenager who takes on his own investigation of a murder in Washington, D.C. The actor who plays the teenager in question in this movie is one by the name of Ansel Elgort. And he is a New York-based actor, a New York native, whose name is definitely Norwegian. And actually, Ansel Elgort is the actor who played Baby in this summer's sleeper hit, Baby Driver. He's also been in The Fault in Our Stars, Divergent, uh, actually the Divergent series so far, and he's got a number of other films that are in the pipeline right now. So Ansel Elgort is a an actor who's pretty much established by now, and I think the the credibility he built up with Baby Driver might help November to Criminals, but then again, we'll have to wait and see. The movie also co-stars Chloe Grace Moretz, Catherine Keener, and David Strahan. So, a lot of really good actors there. It's directed by Sacha Gervasi, who is a British actor, uh, excuse me, a British director, who actually wrote the screenplay to the movie The Terminal, which is one of my favorites. And it's actually one of the only movies that that I love, but no one else seems to love it along with me. Some people do, but outside my family, a lot of people either don't like this movie, don't care for it, or just think it's okay. But The Terminal is actually one of, I think, the most underrated films of the 21st century so far. But in terms of movies he's directed, he actually directed a great documentary called Anvil, the story of Anvil, which came out in 2008. And that's a documentary, a rockumentary, if you will, which, unlike Spinal Tap, is actually true. It's not a mockumentary at all. That's one I recommend. He also directed a movie called Hitchcock, which was about, of course, Alfred Hitchcock, starring Anthony Hopkins as the famous director. And that movie came out in 2012 before I did the show. So that movie passed me by, but. If there's, I, I heard great things about it, and if there's any actor to play Alfred Hitchcock, Anthony Hopkins would probably be the best choice. But November Criminals is a movie I can't guarantee that will come out in a theater near me by next week, but if it does, I'll certainly check it out based on the, the new reputation of Ansel Elgort being a worthwhile person to see in the movies based on Baby Driver and also Sasha Gervasi's very esteemed previous repertoire. So I'll seek that movie out if I can, but if not, I will just review other movies. And the last movie that's coming out in limited release is one that's actually coming out in Los Angeles. So it's not coming to theater near you unless you live near Hollywood. But This is a movie about a 91-year-old Holocaust survivor named Sonia Warshawski, who is the last store in a defunct shopping mall, who runs the tailor shop she owned for more than 30 years. But when she served an eviction notice, the specter of retirement prompts Sonia to revisit her harrowing past as a refugee and witness to genocide. So this sounds like a fictional film and a compelling one at that, but it actually looks like a fascinating documentary. So... I hope this one opens in theaters nationwide, because I'll certainly seek it out. But in the meantime, that just about does it with this week's Words on Film. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the views and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of my own. And they do not necessarily reflect the opinions of any employees working at the stations airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. So I want to thank you guys for listening to Words on Film. I hope you learned a lot. And until next week, this is Dan Burke saying, I'll see you at the movies.